What's going on, guys? Welcome to my eighth episode of Dime Dropper. Before we get started, as always, please remember to follow us on all social media platforms at Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod, as well as follow us on Spotify and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And of course, subscribe on our YouTube channel. I've been getting out content, video breakdowns. I've started to make those for the playoff games. So please check those out. I've gotten actually my most views on um, YouTube videos so far uh, with the breakdowns. So please check those out on my YouTube channel. Anyway, so for today's episode, it's just us again, you and me, and we're going to not go on for too long. By the way, once again, I keep telling you all to give me feedback. I've gotten little to no feedback on the episode that I just had with Asher. So I don't know if that means y'all aren't listening. If you're not listening, tell me why. Is it me? Is it you? Please reach out to me. I want to be in touch with the listeners as much as I can. So please give me feedback immediately when you listen. Please. Anyway, let's get to it. So let's talk about the GSL playoffs since I know that's what you're here for. I initially planned this episode had the season been canceled to be about, I was going to have a friend on to talk about, you know, experiences that he's had with racism and dealing with cops, uh, discriminating against him for his skin color and a, a discussion about, you know, what's relevant and what's really matters right now. But since the NBA wanted to come back and this is a basketball podcast, I'm going to give you guys the basketball stuff. Um, that podcast will happen though. I'm not just going to brush it off. Once the season ends, we were, we will go into that and I'll have my friend on for it. So let's get to it. Let's just talk about, uh, before we even start talking about basketball, we need to acknowledge um, the lives that we've lost recently. I know the coach of Arizona, Chadwick Boseman, of course, sucks to see. And then, of course, the one that kind of hurt me the most was uh, Cliff Robinson, who, um, as you guys know, he was mentioned in my previous podcast about the the Who's the Goat podcast when we were talking about the Rip City Blazers. And Cliff was one of the original stretch fours in the NBA uh, I haven't watched too much footage on him yet, full game footage, but I obviously know his game, you know, a 6'10 guy that could stretch it. He had some athleticism, a six man of the year, an all-star, and I really got to see his personality on the 28th season of Survivor, one of my all-time favorite seasons, and Cliff was such a likable personality, and, you know, to see him, to see that uh, notification when I woke up this morning was so hard to see. And it really just sucks. So condolences to Uncle Spliffy, as they called him. That really sucks, man. Rest in peace. You know, so many of those players on the Blazers are now not alive anymore. Jerome Kersey, Kevin Duckworth, Drazen Petrovic, and now Cliff. And it really sucks, man. I really feel bad for Clyde Drexler, Terry Porter, all the teammates that he had. But anyway, um, let's talk about the game sixes that we have on tap For today, we've got the Clippers and the Mavs, the Nuggets and the Jazz, and then tomorrow we're going to have OKC and Houston. So let's talk about OKC and Houston. They just had game five, and I like the performance in the Rockets. Uh, We got Westbrook back. James Harden was really good, actually. Really good. And if he plays like that, plays a little smart, Rockets will have a good chance to beat a lot of teams. Uh, I I like to see Eric Gordon go into the rim more. He was really missing some ridiculous threes he was taking from like 30 feet. And once he started getting to the basket, it was much easier for him. He was scoring, getting some tough finishes at the rim. Um, as for the Thunder, though, SGA, Gallinari, and Chris Paul can't afford to play like that if they're going to want to win this series. Um, because, yeah, they're just going to need more. This Rockets team is too good for that. They've been switching everything. They've been going into a zone. Uh, in this game today, uh, yesterday in Game 5, Lugens Dort was literally essentially disrespected on the offensive end. The Rockets were leaving him as open as possible, basically daring him to shoot. They were giving him the Andre Roberson treatment, and he was like, I want to say over 9 from 3, over 10. He's a fantastic defender, though. I've really enjoyed watching him play defense on Harden. He's really strong, really strong core, really good lateral quickness. Um, I've really enjoyed watching him. But I think the Rockets are going to win this series. I want to see how Oklahoma City responds. I had Rockets in seven as my original prediction, and it looks like there's a good chance that that could happen. Uh, I want to see how the Thunder respond. You know, this is do or die for them next game. Dennis Schroeder's ejection was really interesting with P.J. Tucker. At first, on first glance, I thought that it was an accidental nut shot. But after seeing a clip of him hitting DeMarcus Cousins in the nuts, 
a couple years ago. It seems that's just something Dennis Schroeder does. So I think the NBA rightfully ejected him. Uh, P.J. Tucker, on the other hand, I mean, he showed some emotion. I guess he made a little love tap with his head. Whatever. You know what I think about the officiating and the soft-ass stuff the NBA does these days. But anyway, Rockets are going to... I'm confident the Rockets got this series. I think there's a good chance they finish the Mountain in the the next game. Uh, Worst case, we'll talk about a potential Game 7. So let's go to the Clippers series. Oh my goodness, this has gotten my blood pressure boiling so much already as I expected. Part of the reason why I didn't want the GSL to happen. I just didn't want the NBA to come back because the stress it puts on me is unbearable. Um, You saw my breakdowns on the Clippers and what they did so well. Obviously, Luka Doncic is proving how much of a superstar he is. An easy top 10 player in the league. He's making a case for top 5 right now. Um, But you know who's been making a case for the top 1 right now? The Claw, who has literally not had one bad game in the playoffs. You look at Giannis, he had a pretty pretty whack game one. LeBron was very average in games one and two. Kawhi Leonard has just been the playoff Kawhi that we saw last year. And you know why he doesn't have bad games? It's because of the shots that he takes. He doesn't take these stupid threes. He gets into that mid post. He bodies people. He has that turnaround for days Man, Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant are looking up from above. Oh, well, Kobe is. Michael Jordan's just watching on TV, smiling at what Kawhi is doing because those mid-post areas, it's just like people glorify these guys that dribble 100 times before they shoot. What's more impressive is being able to just get your shot whenever you want on whoever you want with two dribbles and oftentimes no dribbles. And, man, I love to see someone working in the post. And Kawhi, he's just so locked in. And I love seeing someone on my team. Like, we had Chris Paul, and he had these moments too, but he just wasn't as good at, like, when the going gets tough, and we saw some of this in Game 4 when, you know, Kawhi had his only, I won't even say that was an average game for him, even though he he scored 32 points and was, like, I think 10 of 22. And that's still an average game for his standards because there were things he could have done better. But for him, for that to be an average game, and he fought so hard in the fourth quarter to get us back in the game, so hard. And that's what a great player does. That's what the Jordans did. That's what the Kobe's did. They didn't just roll over and die. They fought and did everything they could to get us to win the game. And that's what the great players do. And when you lose a game like that, it's hard for me to fault him. You know, sometimes players can't be perfect, but what you can give is your effort every fucking time. And Kawhi Leonard does that, and I cannot wait because he is, you know, he's got to get the series done. And the Clippers bounced back really well. I didn't make a breakdown on that video. So the Clippers were rolling on all cylinders. We finally had a game where we were hitting everything. And everyone was hitting everything. But it's truly not hard to have a game like that because it starts with two very simple things. One of them is the intensity on the defensive end. We've talked about it all season long with the Clippers. What Clippers are we going to get on the defensive end? Are they going to be lazy, getting over screens, not talking? Or are they going to come out with intensity, making the right decisions? And a lot of it starts with Doc. I think Doc, I've always been critical of him, but he made some great adjustments in that last game. We doubled Luka a lot more on pick and rolls, which I don't know why we haven't been doing that earlier because even though you're always going to give something up with not doubling in the pick and roll, Luka, just making someone else beat you as opposed to Luka going off is better And someone I'm really annoyed with is, like, Tim Hardaway Jr. and Seth Curry. Like, are these guys going to have bad games? Like, these guys have just been hitting everything and, like, tough shots, too. Seth Curry's been hitting in the mid-range area, floaters, contested threes, off the dribble. Tim Hardaway's been in some tough ones. Like, I'm just hoping these guys have a bad game. And um, But the Clippers, though, with the defensive intensity, they were on it from minute one. Um, even without Patrick Beverly. And the main thing on offense is not settling for bad shots. No stag, not being stagnant. Continue to move the ball. Continue to get good threes. Good ones. And it a lot of it's with Paul George. There's a reason why Paul George and Anthony Davis had bad playoff games so far. Because in those games, they rely on their outside shot to get them going. And then they just fall in love with it. And they're like, oh, I can't hit. Eventually, it's going to fall. No. Get to the rim first when you're so athletic and long. And then the outside game will come to you. It's not rocket science. This is how great players did it back in the day. Paul George went to the basket. He got some easy looks around the rim, layups, and then his jumper was falling. It's that simple. And he said it himself. It's an easy fix. 
it's an easy fix because just seeing as a hooper, I mean, I can tell you, just seeing the ball go to the rim does worlds for someone's confidence. And speaking of confidence, someone who's been a complete difference maker for the Clippers on both ends of the floor has been Landry Shamwet. Oh my goodness, I have been so ecstatic with Shamit in the starting lineup for Reggie Jackson because Reggie's actually been good off the bench. I have no problem with Reggie on the bench. But his basketball IQ is very modern, ridiculous shots because he has he's the type of player. I think he's a really good example of a modern player. He has he's very solid at a lot of things. Like he's not a bad passer, he's a decent passer. He's a decent mid-range shooter. He's a decent finisher. He has a decent handle and he has a decent three ball. But he's not particularly good at any of those things. And his decision making is really bad. So that's why when he comes off the bench, it's a lot better. And Shamit has been unbelievable in the starting lineup. And it started with game three when I saw him make this one three from the top of the key. And then all of a sudden it changed. I'm seeing Shamit play good defense, fighting over every screen. I'm seeing him get to the rim. And like, that's the Shamit that we saw last year that we were so excited about. And it was a time later in the season, or right actually when this GSL started, that Shamit was looking very, you know, not confident in what he was doing on both ends of the floor. And it's crazy to me seeing these players, how much their offensive confidence impacts their defensive confidence and the defensive effort. And it's just a crazy thing. It goes hand in hand, and shamit has been so good. So if I, we, I need the series done tomorrow. Porzingis, you know, best wishes to him. I hope he gets well soon and comes back next year stronger. But we need this series finished on Sunday. We need it done. I, the Clippers have, fun fact, the Clippers have never won a series in six games. This would be the first, and I want that win so bad. So we better get it done. It's been a little bit of a scare, but we are playing a tough team in the first round. This is the Western Conference, and I want it done tomorrow. Kawhi averaging 33 doing his thing. Uh, Utah and Denver is an interesting one because I said Denver was going to win in six, but now it looks like Utah in six, and I think Utah has been – I mean, Donovan Mitchell. I'm a big Donovan Mitchell guy. I don't know if I've talked about it in the podcast yet, but – I was so unbelievably impressed with 2018 when he was a rookie showing insane levels of confidence, outplaying Westbrook and Paul George on the biggest stage. And in my 15 years watching basketball live, I've never seen a rookie that good in my life. Jason Tatum was a good one too, but he had a more experienced team. Donovan Mitchell was taking over for Gordon Hayward in that star role. And he is so good. And the reason, look, this is why Donovan Mitchell's so good. Is everybody, uh, there's this thing about shooters in the NBA, right? And everyone thinks that just because somebody's a good three-point shooter, that means they're a good shooter. That's not true. The best shooters are the ones that can shoot from everywhere on the court. In the mid-range, floaters, three balls. And once again, I don't know if I've also, I don't know if I've mentioned this yet in the podcast. But the best indicator of who good shooters are are not three-point percentage, not field goal percentage because you're not seeing what shots they're taking. It's not true shot percentage either. It's free throw percentage because that's the same shot in every generation that every single person takes with the same amount of pressure in terms of like it's just a free throw. It's one shot and there's nobody guarding you. That's the best indicator of who the best shooters are and how good of a shooter someone is. For example, who are the best free throw shooters of all time? Stephen Curry, Steve Nash, Dirk Nowitzki, Ray Allen, Mark Price. You know, look at Shaq, awful free throw shooter. Look at Kareem, very good free throw shooter. Look at Kobe and Jordan, very solid free throw shooters. Look at LeBron, not a great free throw shooter. You see how it all kind of works together? Westbrook, Rondo. I can keep going on. Free throw percentage is the best indicator. And when I see Luka, he's a fantastic three-point shooter. Not based on percentages, but by the look, like the shots that he makes. Like he has those filthy step backs that are amazing and very difficult. But I've noticed the deficiency in Luka's game. He doesn't have the mid-range game. He only shoots floaters. He's like on some hardened shit. He's on that floater game and his free throws are abysmal as a result. I've noticed. His free throws are way bad for someone who's shooting that well from three. And it just tells you, you need to be able to shoot Like, Kawhi's a better shooter than him. He may not make those step-back threes from distance. Just because you have longer range doesn't mean you're a better shooter than him. So, like, LeBron's shooting shots from 35. That's not mean he's a better shooter than Klay Thompson. Anyway, uh, so that's what I noticed about Luka. But Donovan, back to Donovan, I went on a little tangent here. The reason why I say Donovan's such a good shooter is because 
He can score at all levels, three levels, three ball, mid-range, one of the best floater games, and one of the best finishers in the NBA. And I think that's why Donovan is an elite pick-and-roll pick threat, probably top five in the NBA, easily top ten, and I've been incredibly impressed with his performance in the series. I also have to give, sadly, some credit to Rudy Gobich, who's been good in this series. I don't like his game at all. As you guys know, I don't like those centers that have little to no skill. But he's done a good job being good defensively, and he's done a good job finishing in those pick and rolls on the drop-offs from Donovan and the dunks and whatever, setting good screens. This is his best performance that I've seen in the playoffs thus far. But we'll see um, what he can do in the next round, potentially. Because they're going to need, against better teams, they're going to need Rudy, if, if he's really their second best player, which he is, to be to really prove himself. And uh, another person that kind of scares me a little bit if we play the Jazz is Mike Conley because Mike Conley, as you guys know, I hate the Memphis Grizzlies because of our rivalries with them. Mike Conley was someone who was so good both ends of the floor and in this GSL since he's come back from the birth of his son, he has been really good, looking like old Mike Conley, especially in that game, I think it was game 3. The first one that he came back from his from his son's birth, he was unbelievable. And if I'm looking at Denver, I think they've really missed Gary Harris and Will Barton a lot. And Jokic, I've seen, and I, I'm a big Jokic fan. He is really abysmal in the pick and roll. He's just slow, you know. And um, But Jamal Murray, so let's talk about Jamal Murray for a second. He's had to carry this team in certain stretches to get them the wins in games one and five. And what I'm shocked is that Jamal Murray is such a talented player. And when we talk about great shooters like Donovan, I think Jamal Murray is an even better shooter. Amazing three ball, amazing mid-range. I mean, he's hitting shots from everywhere on the court. My thing with Donovan, I mean, with Gary, uh, Jamal Murray is, why does he only average 18 points a game? Like, in the in today's NBA with that skill set, and you're only averaging 18 points a game? Nuggets fans, I don't have any Nuggets fans that I know of that listen to me. But if you are a Nuggets fan and you're listening to this, please enlighten me on why a guy this good and talented that's averaging 30 points in the playoffs is averaging 18 points a game. He needs to average 20 plus next year. No excuses with the talent that he has. I know he's always been a bit inconsistent, but damn. Uh, so I don't think that the Nuggets are going to come back from 3-1. I think there's a chance they could extend it to 7, but I think the Jazz got this. I think they're too mentally strong and well-coached by Quinn Snyder to blow a 3-1 lead. So I think it will be Utah in the next round against the Clippers. And oh my goodness, give me the Mormons, people. I want revenge on a piping hot platter for 2017. Don't think I forgot. I was at Game 7. I was there. But anyway, that's for the Game 6s. Now, let's get to the two series previews that we got. Actually, I have to touch on the Lakers since they just finished their series. Um, good bounce back, for sure. Uh, I think this Portland team's flaws were exposed, though, and we were very premature with saying, you know, I've heard things like, oh, they're the best eight seed ever, or like, they're the better, they could be the five seed. I truly don't even believe they're better than any teams finished that finished above them. I don't think they're better than Dallas. Um, they don't play defense. <laughs> like, literally, they don't play defense at all. They rely on on Dame. And here's the thing about Dame. I have the utmost respect for him. He's such a good player and such a great competitor. But we need to start holding Dame to the same standards that we hold Stephen Curry to. If we want to put Dame in that conversation with Steph and current point guards right now and Westbrook, we need to hold him to the same standards. He got shut down by Caruso in stretches of this series. Caruso was getting over screens. And I think Alex Caruso... And memes aside, has been the third best player in the playoffs in that series for the Lakers. He's been so good defensively without Bradley. He's assumed that role. And he's done such a fantastic job getting over screens. He basically shut down Lillard in the fourth quarter of game three. And in game four, Lillard was completely obsolete before he got injured. Like, their effort level to start games two and four were very, like, abysmal. And um, LeBron, after having a very average games one and two, has been fantastic quite frankly, in games three, four, and five. I mean, you guys were always telling me, playoff Ron, playoff Ron. Well, he's brought it. He's brought it. But once again, I did say in this series when I was having my preview with Ash in the last episode, this is the series that LeBron needs to be a scorer and be the guy that maybe needed to score even more than AD. I don't even think he did average more than AD in the series. But the guys that they have guarding him are a, a Carmelo Anthony, who's slower, a little older, and less athletic than Braun. And then Gary Trent Jr., who's a very good defender, but he's like 6'4", 215. Like, if LeBron's not getting off on that, then he's definitely not going to get off against 
P.J. Tucker, Daniel House, uh, Jeff Green, and Rocco. And that's going to be his, I think, next series, If uh, assuming Houston wins, it's going to be AD's series that he needs to dominate. LeBron's still going to have to be aggressive and good. And it's going to be a true test on how good LeBron's offense and scoring really is right now. Is he 2018? I think it's very obvious he's not, everybody. And I think if you're denying that, you're being a little delusional because you need to go back and watch the 2018 playoffs and see. LeBron, he finally had a real like injury. It was the groin injury, and he's going to start slowing down. That being said, he could still end up making me take back all my words and that he's the best player in the NBA still. Do I believe it? Not for a fucking second. But if he does, I'll admit it. You know, everyone tries to like, these people that like don't even know me, if any of y'all in the overtime heroics are listening to this shit, Y'all don't even know me. Call me. If you really want to get to talk to me about basketball, you want to know me on a personal level, hit my line. I'm never afraid to have conversations. I don't just say things out of bias. I don't. When I do, I'll admit it. If LeBron plays amazing, if LeBron was truly the greatest of all time, I would admit it. I mean, of course, that's a subjective matter, but... I would admit it. I still do believe that Anthony Davis is the best player on this team. I still believe that they they were equal in this series, regardless of LeBron's triple-double numbers. I watched the series. You've got to account for what Anthony Davis does on the defensive end. He finished the series out with, I think, dropping 43 points in this last game. And congrats to the Lakers. For all you Laker fans out there, it's been a minute. I was in eighth grade the last time the Lakers were in the second round. 2012, I was at game five of the series against Denver. I remember very vividly. So congrats, man. Basketball is always better when the Lakers are in the playoffs the further they go. And what would be awesome is for the first time since 2012 to have two L.A. teams in the playoffs. Sadly, it's not at Staples Center, man, because right now L.A. would be fucking rocking right now. But anyway, congrats to the Lakers and props to the Blazers um, for putting up that incredible fight that they did to get to the playoffs. And I don't know what they're going to have to do with this team. We're going to talk about that in the offseason. Right now, I don't feel like talking about that stuff. But, um... As I, as I said with Dame, he needs to be held to the same standards as his peers that, that you want to compare him to. He has a tendency to sometimes freeze in, in, in moments when he's getting a lot of pressure, when they're starting to trap him on pick and roll and not, you know, being able to do things. And we saw this very evidently last year against the, the Warriors in the conference finals and against New Orleans two years ago. Um, last year in the conference finals, the Blazers were in positions to win games at halftime in a lot of those games. I'm pretty sure games two, three, and four, they all had leads at halftime. And in the third quarter, the Warriors started clamping it up a bit. Momentum started shifting and Dame kind of froze. So I'm just being candid. I think Dame's the best point guard in the league without Curry. Actually, you know what? I may go as far as to say that Luka could be better than him. But if the Mavs lose tomorrow, I'll still stick with the Dame thing. I'll still stick with Dame is a little better for now as my second best point guard in the league after Curry. I'm sorry to Westbrook, even though he's my favorite point guard in the NBA after Chris Paul, Luka has surpassed him, in my opinion. Obviously not all time right now. But um, let's go to end, this, to end this, the episode. Let's talk about the two Eastern Conference series. And the East has been a fucking joke for my whole life, essentially. But these last two years... They've really produced, last year we had four really good teams. We had Boston, uh, Milwaukee, Toronto, and Philly. And then this year we had six really solid teams. Philly, who obviously, I watched the series against Boston, obviously without Ben Simmons. um, You know, they didn't really have a chance. But I did like what I saw from Embiid, actually. I really liked how, how aggressive he was, how dominant he was at moments in the post. But I don't think that the Sixer players did a good job of getting him the ball enough. And, like, one of my big problems with the big men in today's era is if you really go watch the old big men, these guys just post up way too far from the basket. With the, with the, with the rules of the modern NBA and how, like, ticky-tack they are with any physicality on defense, the offensive player should be even more physical and bumping and try to get positioning. And Melo, if you watch him play, does a really good job of this. And AD, Joel Embiid, a lot of these big men, they just post up way too far from the basket. Go get positioned around the basket, get aggressive, go bully someone, and get put pressure on the official. They don't put pressure on these referees. These referees have their whistles so, like, they're so whistle happy, it's crazy. Like, go around the basket. Stop posting up at the foul line. It's ridiculous. Anyway, I think I, I liked Embiid um, in the series. Tobias, very disappointing. I mean, I love the guy, but he's just not confident enough his own abilities. And I don't know what to say. Um, 
Elton Brand, man, former Clipper, my first original Clipper favorite player. Man, you overpaid Al Horford and Tobias. I'm happy for Tobias because he got the bag, but I don't know what you were thinking, paying Al Horford that much when he's declining like that. Like, if the Celtics had paid him that much a couple years ago, I understand, but that? Ugh, whatever. Um, I didn't even watch the Raptors series or the Bucks series. Like, I did, but, like, very, very half ass. Like, I didn't even care. It's just they were playing joke teams. So, like, let's now, so let's talk about the new series. Let's talk about the uh, Celtics and the Raptors now. Oh, my goodness, guys. Second year in a row, we got some dagger matchups in the East second round. I'm really looking forward to it. Philly and Toronto was one of the best second round series I've seen in my lifetime. And um, last year, so Boston and Toronto. I did say that I'm going with the Celtics to win the East from a while ago. I'm going to stand by, even without Gordon Hayward, the Celtics winning this series. I think without Gordon Hayward, it will go seven. However, I don't think that the loss of Gordon Hayward is that big for the Celtics. I think that's out of the big four, the one they can most afford to lose. Because they already have what Gordon Hayward does. A pick-and-roll player that's a score around 18 points a game. And, yeah, he's not absurd at defense. He's not absurd at shooting. They have what he has. It's just going to be more touches for Kemba, for Jason Tatum, and for Jalen Brown. And going into talking about those guys, Jason Tatum has been fantastic. I mean, third-year Tatum is really taking off. 27 points a game in the series. He's averaging 10 rebounds in the series. He averaged 10 rebounds in the series and 49% from the field and 45 from three. Those are astonishing numbers. His free throw percentage, though, 72%. And I've also noticed a deficiency in Tatum's game. Ever since his rookie year, I've noticed it too. He's very suspect when it comes to finishing around the basket at times. That's one thing he needs to improve. It's also his mid-range game because his shot's kind of like a... He's got like a little bit of like a fling shot, and it's it's always long on the mid-range. It's always long. It's almost never short. And uh, that's the next step in Jason Tatum's development. Once he gets the mid-range game on the pick and roll, he's going to be so ridiculous. Uh, everyone that knows me knows how big of a Jason Tatum fan I am. Uh, Kemba was looking fantastic in, I think it was game four of the series. He had some cardiac Kemba moments. He averaged 24 points in the series in only 33 minutes a game, and was shooting 49% and 92 from the line. And Kemba's one of the best pick and roll threats in the league as well. Just like John Donovan Mitchell, great three ball, amazing mid-range game and uh pretty good at getting around getting to the basket and finishing as well. Really good actually. Um Kemba Walker, uh if you're a Celtics fan, man, you're looking looking really really optimistic about Kemba and how he's looked. And of course, Jalen Brown, man. I think Jalen Brown, hot take, has improved more than Ingram this year. I think Ingram has been more of the opportunity situation, whereas Jalen has been on the same team, and he's really just changed his game. I mean, this guy's got an ISO package now. He can create his own shot at a high level. He's scoring. I've seen him hit some mid-ranges. I've seen him hit contested threes. I mean, Jalen Brown, it's starting to look, Celtics fans, like Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are going to be able to lead this team to a championship in a couple years. It's truly looking like that. Credit to trader Danny, man. Good old Danny Age. What an amazing trade that was. Jalen Brown, for the if you want to know the stats, 21 and a half a game, six boards, and his percentages, 45 from the field, 34 and a half from three, so not great, but 92 from the line. And that is pretty phenomenal. So if I'm the Celtics, I was really happy seeing that first round series. Um, but it's it's going to be tough. That wasn't even really a series, in my opinion. Like, it wasn't very challenging. Um, Toronto's going to be a whole different different challenge altogether because they're such a well-coached team. Nick Nurse won Coach of the Year. That was my prediction, too, and, and it came true, rightfully so. Um, they play hard. They play great defense. My thing with the Raptors is, can they win a championship with Siakam as their best player? Van Vliet is actually the leading scorer right now with 21 a game and 8 assists and 4 boards in that first round. And, he, oh my goodness, 53% from the field and 56 from 3 for Freddie V. And I love Freddie V because, once again, he's one of those 3 levels. 3 ball, mid-range, great finisher at his size, and a high basketball IQ. He can get a little 3 happy at times, but who doesn't these days because they're encouraged to do so. I'm a huge Freddie Van Vliet guy, and I love how hard the Raptors play on both ends and how much of a team they are. And let me just say this for all the people talking about, well, look at the Raptors without Kawhi. They're so good. You have to understand 
what championship confidence does to a team. Before Kawhi got to Toronto, they were a joke that was getting destroyed by LeBron because DeRozan and Lowry consistently underperformed. Siakam was a non-factor in 2018. And last year, he broke out. Freddie Van Vliet in, um, developed his game. But ultimately, it was Kawhi Leonard that was the difference that got them the championship. And we talked about this in the Who's the Goat podcast. When you win a championship, your confidence just grows. As we saw with the 93, uh, with the 92 Bulls, 2013 Heat, 2016 Warriors, 2010 Lakers. Do I need to continue or do you get the point? The point is, it's when you have a guy like a Kawhi, like a Jordan, like a Kobe, that's not a super ball dominant guy. I mean, yes, they're ball dominant, but compared to a Harden, compared to a LeBron, Chris Paul, no. So they're not dependent on him to create for them the same way that teams that are built around LeBron are. So that's why I'm hearing this fucking Jason McIntyre calling Kawhi a fraud. I don't even know how that fool has a job, man. I would love to battle it out with any of these fucking idiots on Fox, man. They're idiots. Some of them. Some of them. Um, sorry. Sorry for getting so angry. So, some of the takes I see that, are, like, because the thing is, these guys have such big platforms, and they're spewing this knowledge, spewing these idiotic things about basketball, in my opinion, and, like, people just don't get it. And, like, I'm sorry that, like, I so- I'm sound, if you're listening to me, like, what do you know, dude? Like, this is my, like, life in a way. Like, I pride myself on trying to have the most educated opinion on basketball. I study every era. I'm still doing my evolution of basketball, but I'm stuck on 1972 right now because I'm watching the GSL. But, like, I've been on every side of the coin. I've been a LeBron fan. I'm a stats guy. I've been what I am now, which I think I've figured out. I've kind of figured out who knows basketball and who's not by some comments you can make. And... To really understand basketball and understand what kind of statements you're making about guys today and the standards you're holding holding them to, you need to go watch other eras to see what other stars have done. But we're talking about this Toronto Raptors team. Can they win a championship without a superstar? Now, might you ask, has anyone ever done it? Well, the only team that comes to mind is this 2004 Pistons team. They had no clear superstar. They had some great – I mean – you can argue with me. If you want to argue with me that Ben Wallace, Rashid Wallace, or Chauncey Billups were superstars, I'm not going to like fight too hard against it because there were some. There, all three of those guys were fantastic players and, and real stars in their own right. I mean, Chauncey Billups, if you want to talk about a guy that just is one of the smartest players I've ever seen play basketball and knows his role and makes everyone better, it's Chauncey Billups. Um, once again, assists are not always an indicator of who makes someone better. We know this from the Who's the Goat podcast. If you haven't listened to it, please do. I worked so hard on it. Uh, and now to, to end it, so I'm really I'm really curious into this series. Who's going to win the Siakam-Tatum matchup? Who's going to be the better of the young guys? I would go with Tatum, but man, it's going to be interesting. Kyle Lowry is, you know, his status is questionable for some games of this series. So we'll see how that plays out. I'm, gonna, I'm really excited to see it, but I'm just going to stick with my pick. Celtics in seven, but the Raptors need Lowry if they want to win this series. Um, another guy who's really improved his confidence levels. I think the key for the Celtics in this series, though, is going to be Marcus Smart offensively. We know what he's going to bring on the defensive end, but without Hayward, the Celtics just don't really have too many creators outside of Tatum, Jalen, and Kemba. And that's why having a guy like Hayward and Smart is fantastic to have five creators. But without Hayward, we're going to have to see Marcus Smart be better offensively than he was in round one. Um, Because round one, offensively, Marcus Smart has seen better days. Um, His stats, for all you guys that want to know, uh, Marcus Smart, eight and a half points a game, and percentage is not too good. 33% from the field and 13 from three. Um, 92 from the line, though, so that's good. So let's end with the last series. I'm extremely excited for this one. My favorite Eastern Conference team, the Miami Heat, an amazingly well-coached team. Shout out Coach Spo, great coach, and an amazingly well-rounded team that plays hard on both ends. And when I watch them play, like I'm so jealous in a way because like, I really think, I mean, the Clippers are a really good team, but I just, I, no matter what Doc Rivers does, I do think he's an overrated coach. We don't play like that. We don't play with that same ball movement, that same, they're just such a well-coached team, Miami. They just play such good basketball, and Goran Dragic has been so good in this playoffs, and he, I've just always been a Goran Dragic fan. I got the pleasure of meeting him in Phoenix in 2013, and he was a nice guy. Um, 
But the, the modern NBA, like the more evolved NBA post-2016, fits Goron a lot more because he's always had the floater game. He's always had the mid-range. He's always had a jumper, and he's always had a solid handle and a solid passing ability. So putting Dragic in pick and roll, and uh, pick and roll heavy, is great for him. Um, Jimmy Butler, I love him. Great leader. And, of course, the reason why I think this is going to be the series where we really see how much Giannis has improved. Orlando wasn't a real test. They were missing Aaron Gordon and Jonathan Isaac for, like, every game. This is going to be the true test of how serious Milwaukee is as a championship contender and how good Giannis is. And is he really able to be in that discussion with Kawhi and LeBron? Bam Adebayo, my pick for most improved player, is going to be guarding Giannis. And if you look at their body types, there's maybe no one in the entire NBA better fit to guard Giannis than Bam. I mean, the guy's athletic, he's tall, he's strong, and Miami's going to play team defense. You cannot guard Giannis with one guy in the modern NBA. You can't. But as a team, they're going to be good, they're going to make them work, and you know who else is going to be getting thrown on Giannis? One of the best defenders I've ever seen, Iggy. And I don't know how they managed to get him, but man, I love this Miami team. They got defensive guys, Crowder, Butler, Adebayo. You know, Drogic ain't no slouch either. And um, Duncan Robinson's been shooting lights out. Um, they've just got everything. Tyler Hero as well. They just have no superstar. Actually, you know what? Is Jimmy Butler a superstar? Let me know in the comments. Let me know. Is he a superstar or just an all-star? Now, even if he is a superstar, I question if Jimmy Butler is the best player on a championship team. But is, there's no better position team around Jimmy Butler than this Miami Heat team. If Jimmy Butler's your best player, there's no team of supporting cast that you can put around him better than Miami right now. They're deep. They've got really good, motivated guys, both young and experienced. And I just love this team. And Milwaukee is a good team, but this is it. Put up or shut up for them. I've heard some of their fans saying they're a little scared. And you know what? I'm going out on a limb. I'm not actually, I don't even think it's a limb because a lot of people are going with it. Heat in six, baby. The heat is on. Celtics Heat Conference Finals. I'm calling it right now. I think the defense is going to be too much. I think he's as good as the Bucks' defense is. The, the Miami Heat are, have so many weapons. I mean, you got rookie Tyler Hero coming off the bench averaging 16.5 points a game, you know, as a rookie. So, you know, that's something you got to account for. Uh, it's going to be a big series, though, for Giannis and, of course, for Middleton and Bledsoe and the rest of the guys. It's put up or shut up for Milwaukee because as good as that Boston team was last year, like as talented as they were, they didn't have any chemistry. They were totally out of sync. They didn't like each other. They didn't like Kyrie, if we're being quite honest. This Miami team is the exact opposite. They're so together. They like each other. They're super well coached, and they're playing their best basketball, sweeping Indiana. Yes, I was very wrong on the series. I said Heat and six. I didn't think Sabonis would miss every single game, though. Um, but yeah, so that's my episode, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please tell me what you think, guys. Come on, please. And um, let me know what you want to see next. I think we're going to have a guest on next. Let me know who you want to see. Let me know what you want to see. I may start. I keep, I'm going to probably do a breakdown of Celtics Raptors tomorrow because I've gotten Celtics fans asking me to do breakdowns for them too. So I'm going to probably do a Celtics Raptors breakdown, especially if the Celtics lose. I'm definitely going to do a breakdown. So I'm very excited for the second round between Toronto and Boston and Miami and Milwaukee. Make sure to subscribe on all platforms. Peace.